for the last two Sundays, we've taken a little break from our study for the book of Acts, as we have taken some time to talk about the Lord's Supper. The reason why we are spending these two Sundays focusing on the Lord's Supper is because we have made a, a shift in doing uh, the communion practice once a month to once a week. And the reason why we're taking these two weeks to discuss this is really twofold. One, we want, of course, faithfulness to the Word of God, but we want understanding for why we do these things. Uh, we don't want to be underhanded here and just roll out new practices for no reason, just on a whim. We want it to be rooted in Scripture, uh, but we also want there to be understanding as to why we are doing certain things. We want every single part of this service on Sunday, but every part of our ministry throughout the week to be not just rooted in Scripture, but intended to bring glory to God and bring edification to His people. And so we never want to just roll something out without purpose or significance. And so we're taking the time to understand the significance of the Lord's Supper. But also because we want unity in all that goes on here in the church. And we never want to just get the train rolling and say, all right, well, you know, you better get out of the way or else you're going to get run over. We want us as a corporate body to all be on one page and one accord as we move forward in our ministry. And so my hope is that by discussing these things, we can all come into greater harmony with one another, <coughs> united over the truth of God's word. Now, this issue of the Lord's Supper has been very contested throughout the history of the church. In fact, back in John 6, Jesus gives the analogy about saying, my body is real flesh, my blood is real drink. And it says many who had been listening to him turned away and left. They said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? It's interesting, if you study the history of the early church, the Romans actually accused the early Christians of cannibalism. Because the way that the Christians talked about the Lord's Supper, the Romans thought they were eating flesh and drinking blood at their get-togethers. And so one of the accusations they lobbied against them was that they were being cannibalistic. Uh, if you have any sort of Roman Catholic background, or maybe if you have loved ones uh, who are part of the Roman Catholic Church, maybe that's been your impression. Is when you think about the Lord's Supper, you think of the Eucharist, you think about the sacrifice of the Mass, and you think about all of the fancy plates and platters and and incense and everything that goes with it. And so talking too much about the Lord's Supper makes you maybe a little uneasy. So there was and there is today much confusion over what transpires when we come to this table, when we take the Lord's Supper together. What exactly is going on? Well, I want to make sure right off the bat that we reject what would be a false practice of this. And I don't want to spend too much time picking on the, the Roman Catholic Church specifically, but given the fact that I think for many of us, our hesitancy towards certain aspects of the Lord's Supper is because we're so afraid of, of looking or resembling maybe like Roman Catholic abuse in the way that we do it. And we would, of course, reject some of those key tenets that they would preach. They would say that uh, something called transubstantiation happens. That is that the, the bread and the cup turns literally into the body and blood of Christ. And the priest re-sacrifices, basically, on behalf of God's people. That's why they would call it the sacrifice of the mass. They would see the priest as like an Old Testament Levitical priest, who is re-offering these sacrifices for the people of God. We would reject both of those. We would say that it does not become the literal body and blood of Christ, nor do we say that Jesus is re-sacrificed every week. As we just sang this morning, that he paid the price once and for all. I think the author of Hebrews makes that very clear. Jesus was sacrificed once and does not need to keep on dying or being re-sacrificed. So what we do at the Lord's table, Christ is not re-sacrificed, but what we do is we participate in the reality of his once and for all sacrifice. Does that distinction make sense? We do not re-sacrifice Christ. We participate in the once and for all reality that Christ has been sacrificed. Last week, we talked about the Old Testament backdrop for the Lord's Supper and how the Passover had been instituted. And it was during the Passover that Jesus took those elements present at the Passover meal and proclaimed himself the true Passover lamb, who by being covered under his blood, we would be saved from the wrath of God. We talked about how Jesus inaugurated that in the gospel. And we saw how the early church in the New Testament practiced this Basically, every time they assembled and got together on the Lord's Day, they were partaking in the Lord's Supper. 
And what I would like to do this morning is go over 10 biblical benefits for the Lord's Supper. 10 reasons why it is edifying for us to partake of the Lord's Supper. In your bulletin, you should have got a little sheet like this. And I put that with the scripture references because I would like all of us to take this home and don't just come here on Sunday morning and listen to what I have to say. I would love if we could all go home and spend some time studying these verses, praying over them, and become more familiar with them. There's a whole lot more here than what I'm going to be able to say this morning. And so I would encourage us all to delve into that for ourselves. But we're going to look at ten benefits and ways in which we are edified and grown into conformity with Christ through the Lord's Supper. However, it must be noted that this practice by itself does not magically bestow grace. This practice does not bestow grace in and of itself. That is, you cannot be spiritually numb or come to the table void of faith and expect this participation to result in any sort of grace or benefit simply by the essence of bread and juice by itself. We read in the scriptures, without faith, it is impossible to please God. There is no supernatural power in just the bread and the juice by itself, but rather they are tangible objects by which God communicates spiritual realities. They are tangible objects by which God communicates to us spiritual realities. And unless this is done in humble trusting faith, it means nothing. In fact, as we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, to do so without that faith and that trust can actually result in greater condemnation. And so the only way this has benefit is if, excuse me, if we come in humility and in trust. One of the old church confessions of the 16th century puts it this way, it's talk, talk about the Lord's Supper, and it says, We receive these by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. I love that. It calls faith the hand and mouth of our souls. It's the only way that it has any sort of imparting benefit to us is when it's received in faith. So let's talk about these ten together. We will be referencing a lot from 1 Corinthians 11, uh, but there will be other passages we'll be referencing as well. First of all, Lord's Supper serves as a means of remembrance. Remembrance. We are soberly reminded of what Jesus did on our behalf. You remember in the Gospels, and Paul repeats it here in 1 Corinthians 11, that Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we partake, we are reminded of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. Over and over again, throughout the pages of Scripture, we are told to remember what God has done for His people. And these remembrances were often instituted in a variety of ways. Very frequently in the Old Testament, you'll see them building altars. You know, they build these, these blocks of stone. And so whenever they would pass by, or whenever their children would see it, they'd say, what does this mean? And it would become a teaching opportunity by which they are reminded the faithfulness of God. Very often in the, in the Jewish law, there were certain ceremonies. The Passover itself, if you remember, back in Exodus 12, God said the Passover was to be a memorial meal. It was to be in remembrance of how God delivered His people out of Egypt. And so in the Lord's Supper, we have tangible, visual reminders of what Jesus said. I said this last week, and I'll say it again. We cannot properly function as God's people in the present without always keeping close to our hearts the reality of what God accomplished in the past. Our current status as God's people must be built upon the foundation of what God has done. And if we forget what God has done, we forget who we are. And so we are called to remember. Secondly, it is for thanksgiving. We celebrate the salvation we have in Jesus through gratitude, through thanksgiving. If you remember, again, in the Gospels, and Paul repeats it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24, that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. It says, when he had given thanks. And so we imitate Jesus 
as we partake of the same supper. Now this is interesting because if you remember the verbiage that's used in the Roman Catholic Church, you might be familiar with the term Eucharist. Right? They would talk about having the Eucharist for the Lord's Supper. Now it's interesting because the word Eucharist comes from the Greek word Eucharistia. Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. And in fact, if you look at that word Eucharist, or even Eucharistia, you'll notice the word charis in there. C-H-A-R-I-S. Did I spell it right? Yes, C-H-A-R-I-S. Uh, we have a young lady here this morning. She's one of the young ladies in our youth group. Her name is Charis. And Charis means grace. And so when we have Eucharist, or the Eucharistia, it means our thankful response to God's grace our gratitude in reciprocation for God's grace. And so when we partake, it is one of thanksgiving. We must not be like the nine lepers who you remember Jesus healed them and they went away without saying another word to him. And the, only the one came back giving proper thanks for what God had done for him. And the reason why it's important for us to continually offer this thanks is because the amount of thanks you give to someone must be in proportion to what they have done. So for instance, if you're out in public and someone is kind enough to hold the door open for you, you would look them in the eye and give them a heartfelt thank you. But there is no ongoing debt that is owed after that. It was, it was a kind gesture, but it's a fairly simple gesture, right? You give them a warm thank you, and that's usually the end of the matter. Now, if someone saves your child out of oncoming traffic and rescues them by a hair's breadth, probably every time you see them, you're going to be just thanking them over and over again. Because the greater the magnitude of what someone does for you, the greater the amount of, of gratitude you have for them and to them. And what Jesus has done is nothing less than our eternal salvation. What Jesus has done for us is of eternal significance. Which means our thankfulness should correspond eternal. And in fact, we will, according to the book of Revelation, when you see the saints in glory, we will be forever praising and thanking the Lamb. Eternally. Because what He has done for us is eternal. And so every time we come together and do this, we give thanks. Thirdly, it is for rejuvenation. That is, we are spiritually nourished as our hungry souls feed upon Christ and the benefits He has secured for us. Just as God has given us earthly bread and drink for the nourishment of our bodies, so He has given us spiritual bread and drink from heaven, which is Jesus Christ Himself. If you remember in the Gospel of John, He called Himself the bread of life. He called Himself the, the living water. Only in Him are our souls satisfied. If you keep a hand in 1 Corinthians 11, flip back to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He elaborates down in verse 48. Again, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then the Jews disputed amongst themselves, saying, how could this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Christ's point there is that God graciously provided manna for the Israelites in the wilderness. Praise God, it met their physical, material needs. God gives us physical bread to eat and drink so that we might be sustained. But Jesus said, they still died, didn't they? Even with that gracious provision from God, that material manna was not enough to keep them alive forever. Their bodies still perished. What you need is eternal life-giving. 
What you need is the kind of bread that can rescue you from sin, make you new, sustain your every need, and sustain you eternally. The kind of bread that can give you life, and no earthly bread can do that. Only Jesus, the bread from heaven. So in the Lord's Supper, the physical meal reminds us and points us to the spiritual meal. In the tangible bread and cup that we receive, we are pointed to and reminded of the spiritual bread and drink of life, and that is Jesus Christ. So when we come to this table, we can find nourishment as we are reminded of Jesus. Are you tired, church? Do you roll in here on Sunday mornings just sapped of your strength? Maybe your work is just really beating you down. You run into frustration with your coworkers throughout the week. Maybe you're working grueling hours. Or maybe you're struggling because you're not getting enough hours or enough pay and you're wondering where your next meal is going to come from. Maybe there's broken relationships in your life that just bears heavy upon you. Maybe you are in poor health and that really gets you down. Have the cares of this world, the guilt of your sin, the fear of the unknown. Are you hungry for forgiveness, for hope, for purpose? We are invited to come, eat, and be satisfied. As we feed upon the bread from heaven, not just tangible, but be living Jesus himself. Come and participate. Fourthly, we have communion with God. Now, if you'll look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just a chapter earlier, Paul is addressing the same issue of the Lord's Supper. And he says in verse 16 of chapter 10, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the same. Now, it's interesting because in verse 16, the word there that's used, participation. Participation is that word koinonia. Most of us are probably familiar with the term koinonia. It means fellowship or communion. When we talk about having koinonia with one another, it is a communion with one another. And according to this verse, when we partake in it, we are experiencing koinonia, fellowship, communion, with God himself through the blood of Christ. And that's where the term communion comes from. We are communing with God. And that's because Jesus is our mediator who establishes that bridge between us and God. On our own, in our natural sinful selves, we are outside of God's camp. We have no rightful access to the king. We have no access or worthiness to sit at his table. We are poor beggars outside whose rags make us dirty and unclean and incapable of sitting in a place of prominence at the king's table eating his supper. But Jesus, 1 Timothy tells us, is the one mediator between man and God. And it is by his once and for all sacrifice, by his shed blood, that we now have access into the Holy of Holies. And because of him, we can now boldly approach the throne. And so on the merits and completed work of Christ, we can now commune with God once again. We can now approach God boldly. Jesus takes us into the Holy of Holies and seats us with himself at the table. But not only does it give us communion with God, but you see there in number five, it also gives us communion with each other. Because remember in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, the very next verse says, For there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. That is, we are partaking together. The communion with God in verse 16 is done as a community together in verse 17. We share as one body, as one family gathered around the table, enjoying a meal with one another. In fact, I think it's interesting, he even talks about sharing the cup with one another. And there's some churches where they do that quite literally, right? You will all drink out of the same chalice. Don't worry, we're not going to do that here. But 
you typically would only share a cup with someone that you are very close to, usually someone you're related to. I think probably the only person I would share a cup with would be my wife. Maybe your kids, well, <laughs> I've got a two-year-old, so you drink after him and you never know what you're going to get. But typically you would only do that with someone you're very close to. And so this imagery about sharing a cup together implies a closeness, a unity. In fact, in our text this morning in 1 Corinthians 11, 17-22, Paul is rebuking them precisely because of their lack of unity as they shared the Lord's Supper together. Look there again where he says, I do not commend you. In fact, I've got a rebuke for you. When you come together, it's not for the better, it's for the worse. So he says there's some people who show up early and they indulge too much on the bread and they're gluttonous. And there's some who are drinking too much of the wine and they get drunk and they don't leave some for others. Or maybe there's not proper distribution to the people who are poor and who actually need it. And so it's done for selfish, carnal reasons rather than as service and love and unity for one another. It was done for selfishness rather than out of service. One of my favorite times of the day is when I get home from work and I get to sit down with my family around the table. So we talk about our day or we do our Bible devotion or we just share that special time together. God is so good that not only did he make food, which is so essential for our survival, not only did he make it delicious, but there is something so special, isn't there, about sitting down and having a meal with someone. When you want to get together with an old friend, don't 